Over the weekend, I was talking to a friend who was packing for a 10-day family holiday, and I'll tell you what, it sounded as stressful as heck. If you're about to go on your summer break or vacation, in this video, hopefully, I'm going to help reduce that stress, well, at least from a tech point of view. Look, there's enough for you to think about when you're packing for holiday, like flights, check-in hotels, taxis, and insurance, and that's before we even get to the kids if you've got them. The last thing you need to be worrying about is what tech to pack. But the good news is that if you've got an iPad, you've got pretty much all you need in one compact device. There are a few camera settings I'm gonna go over in this video just to make sure you're getting the most out of your iPad and I'll cover those a little later on. Also, also I'll mention a few niggles that have started to raise their head the more I use my iPad. But first, why take your iPad with you on holiday in the first place? It struck me that the iPad is the perfect holiday companion because it ticks so many boxes. If you're stuck in the airport, for instance, or on a long flight, as we all know, the iPad is a hell of a great content consumption device. Whether you're binging on Netflix or catching up with the latest series on Apple TV, and presumed innocent, with Jake Gyllenhaal, by the way, is brilliant, the panel on all iPads are stunning, but the latest tandem OLED display on my M4 iPad Pro is the best display outside of the Vision Pro that I had a demo on last week that I've ever used. The four speaker stereo setup on the iPad is great. Say you want to have the iPad, I don't know, as a central entertainment pod in your hotel room for the family to enjoy. It's plenty loud enough. You won't have to pack any other speakers, even without AirPods, podcasts or music. It's a joy to listen to on the iPad. Good bass, clean mids. They have played a blinder with the audio on these latest iPads. And if you love reading, the larger screen of an iPad is perfect. Whether that's news, books, or your favorite blog, the screen is bright enough that it's easy to take the iPad with you and read in bright environments. And the standard anti-reflective coating does a good enough job at reducing glare too. And if you say fancy brushing up on your long forgotten drawing skills on holiday, the iPad and Pencil Pro make a great combo. The battery life, although not as good as I'd hoped it would be, will get you through the best part of the day in general use. And if you need to do a little bit of work while you're away, the iPad lends itself perfectly to that as well. It's easy to catch up with general admin, emailing, making notes, setting reminders so when you get back, or editing spreadsheets in numbers. As I said before, working on an iPad feels um, less officey. So even if you have to catch up on a few bits of work, it feels a bit less formal than getting a MacBook out or reaching for your phone. You know, there's, there's an argument made that away from the normal day-to-day -day grind in the office, the iPad actually starts to shine and come to life. No longer are we concerned about multitasking or the shortfalls of iPad OS. Nope, now we just want the iPad to get stuff done, relax, and have a bit of fun, and that's where it comes to life. Earlier, I said that the iPad is pretty much all the tech you need to take away on holiday, and I stand by that. Yes, of course, you're gonna to need to take your phone too, that's a given, but with the iPhone and the iPad combo, you really don't need anything else. And if you're on holiday, one of the main features you're going to want to use is the camera app, right? The camera app on the iPad is a bit of an unsung hero, and I, I know why. Look, I know the iPad is a little bit cumbersome to use, but if you're on holiday, you just want to use what you've got to hand. Maybe you want to park the phone and leave it in the hotel room for a few days to make sure that you're properly switched off from work, and who could blame you for that? And that's where the iPad comes in. And if you spec your iPad with the cellular option, you can be iPhone free and use the fast onboard 5G connectivity. They say the best camera is the one you've got with you. And if that's the iPad, just go with it. The beauty of the iPad is it's an all-in-one device. You can shoot, edit, and share all on that one device with a pro camera system that has studio quality mics and four speakers. You can capture 4K ProRes video, hop on video calls with family or friends at home with that new front-facing landscape camera, and even scan receipts or hotel bills for your records, which is now powered by an enhanced AI engine. You can even set up Apple Pay on the iPad too, that so you can pay those bills without reaching for your phone. It's all about ease, trying to pack and take as little out with you as possible. The video specs of the iPad cameras aren't shabby. You have a 12 megapixel wide camera, which shoots in 4K ProRes video, as I mentioned, and the front-facing landscape camera is also a 12 megapixel camera, but with an ultra wide lens. And that has center stage. Now, I'm not a big fan of it. And if you're the same as me, it can be turned off when on FaceTime calls via the control center. You can shoot 4K video at 24 or 30 FPS, or in 1080 at 30 or 60p. You can shoot in 720, but why you'd want to, unless you're specifically shooting to post on Twitter, I don't know. And why is 720 even still a thing on iPads now? 
For those dramatic filmy sequences, you can shoot in slow-mo too in 1080 at 120p. Those mics I mentioned, well, they do a decent job of capturing audio as well. And with the voice isolation feature, it does a good job at cutting out some of the unwanted background noise as well, helping you to record clean audio. I mentioned about the noise reduction on the mics, the voice isolation. When I'm out at the moment, there's a couple of cars around, there's a traction in the background, there's just general ambient noise. So you'll get an idea of quite how good the speakers are on this iPad as the car goes behind me of reducing any kind of outside noises just to isolate the voice that little bit better. If this is the first of my videos you've come across, well, you found the channel at a really exciting time. Not only is iPhone 16 season just around the corner, but we are fast approaching our first 10,000 subs. I've worked super hard making content every week for the past three years, and we are starting to build up a lovely community here too. Supporting the channel is super easy and free. Have a look around at the videos on the channel, and if you like what you're seeing, a sub would be amazing. Oh, and something that I always forget to do when I subscribe to a new channel is turn on notifications as well. It, I just want you to be the first to know when I upload a new video. The photo side of the camera is more than able to with a 1 and 2x camera, both having a 5x digital zoom, although it's pretty grainy, and I would suggest not using it all that often. You can shoot in either Heath or in JPEG, but for now, there are no raw options to shoot on the iPad. You can shoot in square or portrait and you have a three or 10 second timer with a live option on the standard shots. And I'll come to that in a moment. With the portrait mode, I always like to wind back the depth of field, the soft blur in the background to around an f-stop eight or nine. Otherwise, I feel the bokeh effect starts to look a little bit phony, but you can play with it and get quite a natural result. In the portrait mode, you also get to choose the lighting effect as well if you fancy. The contour option, for example, gets quite a pleasing result, but I often rely just on natural light. If you want to take some gorgeous shots of the horizon or beach where we're on holiday, there's also the option to shoot in panoramic just like on an iPhone. As I mentioned earlier on though, there are a few basic settings you may want to go through in the settings menu to make sure you're getting the most out of your iPad's camera. Most of these are one and done, so once you set them, you'll never have to revisit them. Go to settings in the camera app. First of all, select the default video setting you want, which for me is 24p. Also, make sure lock white balance is on. Honestly, it's a much safer option unless you really know what you're doing with a camera. Oh, and while you're there, you might as well set your slow motion settings too. Next is the camera capture formats. Which you choose? Well, that's gonna come down to personal choice and how much local storage you've got. I chose the most compatible, which means the default settings will for the photos be JPEG and H.264 codec for video. Now, preserve settings is super, super handy. It means every time you pick up the camera, it will revert to how you last shot. Camera mode means it will go back to video or photo. And in the camera app, it will even remember if you shot square or full screen, for instance. The depth setting, that will recall the f-stop settings that I just mentioned. So once you find your sweet spot, you won't have to waste time setting it again. Told you, it's one and done. And the live setting. Setting that will leave the feature either turned on or off, whichever you prefer. When you leave it on though, it gives you more options in post to play with things such as long exposure shots and so on in Apple's Photos app. I assume you'd always want to shoot with stereo audio, so I've got that ticked on. Scanning QR codes is always handy, as is text detect. Now, the grid is something I swear by when it comes to getting a good composition for your shot. And that level meter means it's easier to get a straight shot rather than having to waste time in post later on. The more you can get right in camera, the better. Using the grids is easy. It's just a standard rule of third. It takes all the guesswork out of uh, getting a good photo or video. I even use that same grid system on my Canon I'm using now when shooting these videos. With all those settings made, you are good to go. But if you use an Apple Pencil, there are a couple of settings I like to make there too. Firstly, the squeeze option. For me, I like to set it to a shortcut to open the recently played option in Apple Music. It's just one less distraction for me when I'm working. You can also set the double tap feature to various choices. I've currently got it set to the eraser, but I often play around with that one as the fancy takes me. And I'm sure you probably already know this, but you can set up hot corners just like you can on a Mac. Using Apple Pencil, you can choose between taking a screenshot, note, or disabling it from both the left and right bottom corners of your iPad. And now, with Final Cut on the iPad, if you've taken loads of stunning footage on holiday, you don't have to wait until you get home to start editing. You can get to it whilst on holiday. That means you can send finished videos back to friends at home or post them to your socials on the fly, which is really neat. And if you want to impress that much more, then why not grab the free Final Cut camera app 
and get into some multi-cam shots. Honestly, it's super, super simple to set up and use, and it will take your videos to the next level. All you need is an iPhone and an M4 iPad. And although I'm not gonna cover it in this video today, if you want me to go through it in further detail, let me know and I'll make a video about it in the future. I've used it loads and I'm a massive, massive fan of it. I'm still loving my iPad journey, but now I'm using it more. There are a few problems or issues that are starting to come to light. Let's, let's start with the keyboard. The keyboard, as great as it is to type and work on, gets stuck for no obvious reason. Let's say I want to go back and add or delete some text, the cursor just won't go where I want it to go. And that's using the first party magic keyboard from Apple. The workaround is having to close whichever app I'm using and relaunch it, which isn't perfect, not on a keyboard that costs this much money. And the 13 inch iPad Pro, which is the one I've got, is heavy, deceptively heavy. I was in London at the weekend for the final e -pre of the year, the electric Grand Prix. I put the iPad in my rucksack in the morning and by the end of the day, I knew all about it. It was more as if I was carrying around a MacBook Pro. Yes, I know I could lose weight by leaving behind the keyboard, but I'd be losing functionality and protection. So if portability is a big thing for you, just consider that when choosing which model iPad you're going to buy. Also, the Apple Pencil is too vulnerable and exposed where it is at the top on the iPad. As strong as those magnets are, it either falls off in my rucksack or you feel as if it's going to get knocked off and lost if you're carrying the iPad around. I wish the rumor of the pencil storing and charging in the hinge of the keyboard had come through. It makes way more sense. Oh, and when I'm back off of holiday and back in the office, I'd like more flexibility of how I can resize windows. It's not a big issue, and I'll be covering that more in future videos, so make sure to get subscribed. Lastly, there's that battery issue that I mentioned. It's still a concern. It has good and bad days for no obvious reasons, but it never gives that 15 plus hours, I think they quoted 18, that Apple suggested. So there you go, the iPad, the perfect holiday companion. If you're off on holiday over the next few weeks, I'd love to hear your stories about what tech you're packing and how you're gonna use it. Let me know what your out of office setup is in the comments. And if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications too. It honestly does help me out more than you can imagine. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next week.